On the show today, the Rugby World Cup heats up. The AFL trade period is in full swing. And Mitchell Stark is on track for a record-setting summer. Stick around for all that and more. This is the Armchair Experts. Hello and welcome to the Armchair Experts and thank you so much for joining us as always. My name's Daniel Jeffrey, alongside me is Jordan Matthews and together we'll be taking you through another big week of sporting action. That's right, we'll be previewing the Rugby World Cup quarterfinals as well as having a bit of a look at an iconic cricket store in Sydney. But first let's get some news headlines where we start with the AFL trade period. Geelong have been the most active AFL club following an exciting start to the postseason trade period. The Cats acquired Adelaide star Patrick Dangerfield, Carlton's Lockie Henderson and former Eagles Scott Selwood, who joins brothers Joel and Troy at the Cattery. Hawthorne Premiership player Matthew Suckling confirmed his move to the Western Bulldogs, while Sydney's Lewis Jetta has been traded for the Eagles' Callum Sinclair. V8 Supercars veteran Craig Lowndes claimed his sixth Bathurst 1000 crown on Sunday to cement his name among the greats of the sport. Despite being two of the oldest drivers on the mountain, Lowndes and co-driver Stephen Richards cruised to victory in the final laps. To cricket now, and former New Zealand batsman Lou Vincent has told the jury at the Chris Cairns perjury trial that match fixing is widespread. Cairns is facing jail time of up to seven years after he allegedly lied under oath, claiming he had never cheated at cricket. A host of international cricketers, including Ricky Ponting and Brendan McCullum, are set to testify against Cairns. Staying with cricket, and Mitchell Stark's impressive run of form in the Matador Cup has continued after he tore through Tasmania earlier this week. The Blues' quick now has 19 wickets in four matches and is eyeing off an Australian domestic one-day record of 24 wickets. Stark will be looking to continue his good run of form when New South Wales take on Queensland in a day-night match tomorrow at Dremoyne Oval. So as always, plenty of sport going on this week and uh, none more so important than the Rugby World Cup which enters its quarter-final stage this weekend. Australia are up against Scotland. Wallabies have been one of the most impressive teams so far in the tournament. How do you rate their chances? Look, pr pretty good to be honest. They have been probably the most informed team of the, in the tournament and you could probably argue Scotland are the weakest out of the eight remaining sides. Um, Australia have been playing very good rugby, both defensively and in attack. I think if they keep doing what they're doing, they probably will account for Scotland pretty easily. Now, in saying that, Scotland have a pretty good record against Australia in recent times. They've won two of their last three matches against the Wallabies. So, look, Michael Checker's men won't be complacent going into this game but I think if they do what they have been doing well they shouldn't have any problems. Yeah Scotland have been shaking defence in the group stage and you think if their defence isn't absolutely watertight against the Wallabies they could it could get a bit nasty. You, know, you look at the Wallabies back line and it has the potential to be absolutely lethal. Scotland need to be really tight in defence. Yeah absolutely. Guys like Bernard Foley have been giving Australia that real potency in attack which they've been looking for and I guess his kicking game has been excellent. He's kicking for goals and obviously a huge asset but it's when he gets forward and breaks a line it's been brilliant. He's been getting in for tries so they'll obviously look at him to be a key player again this match. Um, a lot's been made of Australia's scrum, so obviously the props, Scott Seo and Sakopi Kepu have been in excellent form throughout the tournament. They've probably flown under the radar a bit, but you know, they've been setting a really good platform for Australia's backs to really dominate in attack. Yeah, for me, Australia's key players are in the back of the scrum. David Pocock has been amazing so far, playing out of position at number eight. He's just been lethal at the breakdown. He's got more turn turnovers than anyone else in the competition at the moment. Another player who's really impressed me has been Scott Fardy. He's probably fly, flying under the radar a little bit with Pocock and Michael Hooper playing really well, but at number six, Fardy has been absolutely brilliant. We'll need those guys to keep on playing well if the Wallabies are to keep going well in the tournament. Yeah, definitely. And if we look outside the Australia-Scotland game, do you think there's any of the Northern Hemisphere teams that can make a real impact? Well, you'd almost count France out automatically because they're playing the 
All Blacks. For me, Ireland were probably the one team who had the best chance. You know, they're up against Argentina, who are the weakest of the Southern Hemisphere teams. But in saying that, Ireland have been smashed by injuries and suspension. Paul O'Connell, their captain, is out. Johnny Sexton, their halfback, he's in doubt with an injury. Uh, Peter Omani, he's out as well for the tournament. And then Sean O'Brien has been suspended for the game against Argentina. So you think... You know, Ireland probably had the potential. They've been playing really well so far in the tournament, but these suspensions and injuries have just killed them. I actually think Argentina is going to win and we're going to have four Southern Hemisphere teams in the semi-finals. Yeah, look, it's probably not a bad bet. I guess you look at Wales, they're the other, group, the other team from Australia's group. They had a very tough game against Australia last week. Defensively, it would have been very gruelling on both sides. Um, they take on another powerhouse of international rugby this weekend in South Africa. You'd think that South Africans are going to be too strong. They haven't been. They, they started slowly, but I think it's probably time they're just going to flick the switch and really account for Wales pretty easily. You know, as you said the other game, New Zealand are probably going to account for France, for France pretty easily. So it looks like we we could get four Southern Hemisphere teams in the semi-finals, but we'll just have to wait and see. Yeah, looking forward to it all, no doubt. Moving on now, with cricket season well underway in Australia, many cricketers are looking to purchase new bats. With that in mind, we went to Kingsgrove Sports Centre, who have been selling cricket gear for as long as anyone else in the business. For the past month, Kingsgrove Sports Centre has been packed with cricketers looking to fill their kit bags for another season. But even though the store is entering its 40th year of business, stocking up on cricket bats isn't always a simple task. My wife's always having a go at me that I'm uh, overstocked, you know. I like giving my customers choice and selection. She likes to ensure that we only buy the stock we need and, and sell what we have. The improvement of cricket bats has had some fans claiming the balance between bat and ball is becoming less and less even. However, Harry Solomons, Kingsgrove's managing director, doesn't see a problem with it. It's great to see that the bats have improved. What they've done is obviously they've, they bore them a little bit more, they're adding big edges. And of course, they're extracting all the moisture out of it, so they keep that lightness going. Uh, and of course, they, they, they're a lot softer, yeah. so they tend to come off better. And because of the ball, they go higher. That's why the players today hit them into the third floor, instead of in the old days when they cleared, just cleared the fence. Although the rise of online sales may have been an issue for a store specialising in a product that depends so much on touch and feel, Kingsgrove has adapted to the new retail environment. Initially, I was a bit, uh, bit worried about online because of the fact that Australians would be able to go to India or Pakistan or England and get a cheaper product. On the other hand, it's also opened us to the world. We sell gear to America, it's a big market. We sell gear to Canada, it's a big market. We sell gear to Europe, to New Zealand, to Papua New Guinea, to India. However, the store serves more than just amateurs, with a number of professional players calling on Kingsgrove for bat repairs and other tune-ups. So these three bats were left here by Steve Smith before he went to England, so we can clean it out, polish them up, buff them up, and have them ready for re-stickering. Good stick that. Maybe I should borrow it. Yeah, it's one of the most well-known stores in New South Wales, probably, and obviously a bit of a cricketing mecca in Sydney, isn't it? Yeah, no doubt. And really interesting story with Harry Solomons. You know, he came out from Sri Lanka just over 40 years ago, worked as a guard in, at Long Bay Prison, and now he started, you know, this extremely prestigious cricketing store. It's, it's a really good story. But um, let's move on to what we learned this week. Jordan, what was your biggest takeaway from the past seven days in sport? Yeah, look, we spoke about a bit about it last week, and I guess if we hadn't learned it already, we've definitely learned it now, and that is that the AFL free agency needs to change. Now, the biggest issue with it is the restricted free agency compensation, where if a player leaves your club as a restricted free agent, the AFL compensates you with a pre-season draft pick. Now, Matthew Lewenberger is leaving Brisbane as a restricted free agent, and the best the AFL can offer them is pick 39 in the AFL pre-season draft which is ridiculous for a bloke who's a premier ruckman at your club, a previous number four draft pick. It, it seems unbelievable. We saw the same thing happen with Patrick Dangerfield at, at Adelaide where they were worried about what, what compensation pick they would get if, if Dangerfield left. 
there's an issue with it. It needs to change. And I guess when it, when it's time to look at it next season, I think the AFL has to make a, a hard stance decision on it. Yeah, I think it, it wouldn't be surprised in if it changes next year. For me, though, what I took away from this week was that with the collective bargaining agreement between the Professional Footballers Association and the FFA not signed yet, I learnt that the A-League shouldn't have started last week. The reason I say this, you look at American sports, whenever there's a collective bargaining agreement that goes unsigned, the players get locked out from the league and we don't have any games until that pay dispute is settled. And while that's not great for fans because, you know, we all love to see our sport keep on going on, it does show how seriously everyone takes that pay dispute. You contrast that to what we've got going on in football in Australia at the moment. The Matildas were forced into cancelling their tour to the USA, whereas all our male footballers, they haven't missed a game or a paycheck. You know, I just can't believe that the A-League, the start to the A-League season has begun uninterrupted. Yeah, obviously it's a huge issue and let's hope it all gets resolved soon. But moving on now and following England's early exit from the Rugby World Cup, questions have been raised as to the scheduling of the tournament's draw. We took it to the whiteboard to break it all down. The Rugby World Cup has thrown up some pretty great storylines so far this year. We've had Japan beating South Africa, Georgia looking like a team that knows how to play rugby, and England, well, being very English and getting themselves knocked out of the group stage. However, as funny as England's early exit is, it highlights a pretty serious issue with the timing of the Rugby World Cup draw. The draw for this World Cup was made in December of 2012, nearly three years before the start of the tournament. Now, while the draw obviously has to be made sometime before the start of the tournament, three years is surely too long. Rankings change a lot in that time, making seedings by the time the Rugby World Cup starts often outdated. For example, when the draw for this Rugby World Cup was made, Samoa was one of eight teams ranked higher than Wales, leading to the now infamous Group of Death. You'd think that, in light of England's failure, World Rugby would realise their mistake and push the draw for the next tournament closer to the start of the tournament. Unfortunately, you'd be wrong. Rugby World Cup organisers admitted this week that an earlier draw would benefit the tournament, while simultaneously saying that the draw for Tokyo 2019 is likely to stay in its early time slot. The reason for this is that organisers believe the early draw will boost ticket sales for the tournament. But the fact of the matter is that rugby fans, you know, the people who buy tickets for the Rugby World Cup want to see an even tournament. And while we all love to see a Minnow Nation do well, that shouldn't be at the expense of a strong team drawn in a group far more difficult than any other, even if that team happens to be England. Yeah, look, obviously there's a huge issue there. A lot can change in three years, can't it? Yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, it's not great when you're being compared unfavourably to FIFA. But you look, the Football World Cup is drawn six months before the tournament. I think rugby should really go down that path. And, you know, it'll make the seedings, it won't make them perfect, it'll make them more relevant by the time the tournament starts. But let's move on to the Fast Five now for this week, and we'll start with the AFL trade period. Geelong have been very busy, as we mentioned early. Does the additions of Patrick Dangerfield, Scott Selwood and Lockie Henderson make Geelong a top eight team next year? Definitely, in my opinion. You know, we're talking about a side here was only one game outside of the eight. So picking up an elite midfielder at the top of his game, Lockie Henderson, who's a genuine spine player, and it's exactly what Geelong needed, and Scott Selwood, who only three years ago won a best and fairest for West Coast. So you're picking up three quality established AFL players to go into a side who has a fairly young list but just need a bit of a revamp and 100% not only will they be top eight but they'll be pushing up there I reckon. Yeah I think they'll be competing for the top four if we're being completely honest. They weren't far behind the top eight last year. I think you know obviously Geelong have got some great veterans around that team. Uh, Joel Selwood in particular. I think they'll have a good year next year. Yeah definitely okay so moving on to cricket. Matador Cup New South Wales have been red hot form. Do you think anyone can stop them? Uh, no, not really. I mean, the only way you can imagine these guys losing is if Mitchell Stark bowls a couple of beamers in the first over and then can't bowl his remaining 10 because he has been on fire. Um, and then you look at the rest of their bowling attack. Gurinder Sandhu, Sean Abbott, Stephen O'Keefe, Nathan Lyon, Moses Henriques, Shane Watson, all of these guys have played for Australia. You know, 
that bowling attack is capable of defending just about any total. It's hard to see him losing. Look, not only is their bowling attack red hot, look at their batting. You've got Nick Madison, who's opening the batting, averaging 100. Ed Cowan, who is a former test player, and he's batting as well as he ever has. Steve Smith, who's arguably the best bat in the world, now our test captain. That's just the top three. You've got Shane Watson, Moz Enriquez. It's ridiculous, really. If there was a salary cap, they'd be over it. Yeah, no, they're certainly looking the goods to take home this tournament. But let's look at the other end of the table. What's been made about the Cricket Australia 11 and their inclusion into the tournament? Do you think it's been a success or a failure? Look, for them, winning a game was always going to be a success. Now, the first two games, obviously, they got beaten comprehensively against the best two sides in the competition for that matter. But, you know, this was never about winning or losing. It was about getting these young players in into a squad where they could develop. If they were good enough to be making their state squads, they'd be playing in the state team. So, you know, I think it was all just a bit of a learning curve. Has it been a success or a failure? I guess it, it depends. You'd have to ask the players, wouldn't you? Uh, essentially, it's about their development. It's not about wins and losses because they were never going to be realistically competitive with the best, the best cricketers in, in Australian domestic cricket, were they? Yeah, as you say, it's all about developing these players and giving them the chance to test themselves against uh, developed first-class cricketers. I think from that standpoint, it's been a success. And I think as a result of their inclusion, we're going to see a few of Australia's best young cricketers really fast-track their development. Yeah, 100%. OK, so moving to football now. A-League season started on the weekend. Who do you think was the most impressive from the start of the season? Well, it's a bit hard because kind of the four teams that we tipped to, to be the front-runners in the competition all played each other and all played out draws. Um, with that in mind, I'm going to say Central Coast. A lot of people writing them off at the start of the season. I'm still going to write them off as, you know, with any chance of winning something this year. But, you know, their defence was a bit shaky against Perth. They conceded a couple of goals, but they still scored three. They got the win. Nice to see them start the season well. Yeah, definitely. I guess you've got to also look at John Aloisi's boys, Brisbane Raw. You know, they had a good 3-1 victory. Western Sydney probably didn't take all the chances they could have up front. It could have been a completely different story if they did. However, you can't fold them. You can only play who walks out there against you on the pitch. And they won 3-1. Excellent start to the season. And he'd be really happy. Yeah, definitely. Now, let's finish up Look, staying at football, but looking overseas to the English Premier League. A lot of injuries from the recent in international break. Do you think those injuries have derailed Manchester City's title bid? Derailed? Definitely not. Uh, you know, you lose guys like uh, Sergio Aguero, David Silva, company, Kolarov, they're going to affect any team. You know, they're going to be an instrument instrumental part of your team. However, Manchester City's squad is so, is so deep the guys that are coming in are still quality footballers. They're Premier League ready and, you know, they're going to fill the void pretty well. Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, this squad is as deep as any in the Premier League. And then you look at Manchester City's schedule for the next four weeks is about as good as they could hope for. They've got a very tough game against Manchester United in a couple of weeks. But other than that, the other three games, they play Bournemouth at home this weekend, then Crystal Palace and Norwich City both at home again. It's as good a run as you could ask for in the Premier League. They should be fine. Yeah, look, they should be fine, shouldn't they? We're running out of time now, guys. And as always, we'll leave you with one suggestion, something to check out this week. Dan, what do you got for us this week? Uh, I reckon you should have a look at the latest instalment on John Oliver's hilarious war on FIFA. If you haven't seen any of it so far, there have been a couple of his segments that have just been brilliant in taking FIFA to task for all the corruption allegations that surround him. There's another one. It's a bit shorter than the last two. It's only a couple of minutes. But he just goes into detail about the recent suspensions for Sepp Blatter, Michel Platini, and Jerome Valka. Have a look at it. We'll chuck the link in the description. It's worth your time. Yeah, definitely. And that's all we've got time for this week, guys. But make sure you check us out on Facebook and Twitter and also subscribe to UOW TV to keep up with all the latest episodes. Yeah, that's right. We'll be back this time next week for another instalment of all your sporting news. Until then, grab yourselves a good armchair for the upcoming Rugby World Cup quarterfinals and we'll see you then. Take care.